And of course, basically, uh, we just, when we first come to know the Lord, we surrender because he's the king. And when we surrender, he accepts us, we're adopted, he makes us children of God, and the rules change. He starts walking, talking, sharing, dwelling in us, and he says, now I have to reteach you some of the ways that I walk so that you don't get the religious things all mixed up. All right, the book of Romans. Amen. Now, how many of you, of course, you didn't get caught um, not knowing, so you reviewed your notes and you found out what one's about, what two's about, what three's about. So we're going to make a stab of it. The idea is I, somebody should say, well, can you tell me about the book of Romans? And you could say, yeah, chapters one's about this, 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 this. And when you do that, I mean, just keep it simple. People are interested in the word. Because what happens a lot of times when they read the word, they get it out of context. Or they forget to apply it to himself. And we don't know who he's talking to or what they're talking about at times. So it's good to study the book, put it in sections. So the book of Romans chapter 7 tonight. Amen. Good to have you here this evening. Amen. Tonight's teaching is on chapter 7. But let's review the key truths leading to the chapters, okay? Chapter 1, can you remember what it was about? It's right there in your notes anyway. Okay? Yeah, it's about what happens when humans reject God. And they can get pretty filthy. In fact, let me just tell you um, that in Galatians uh, 5, I think around verse 19 through 20, just before the fruit of the Spirit, it says the works of the flesh are... And it lists some pretty grody things. Adultery, fornication, murder. All these things are what the flesh is capable of doing without God. Then we get to chapter 2. What's chapter 2 about? Come on, tell me. Religious judging, Religious judging of others. Practicing the same thing. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. Here's a person, we call them hypocrites. They're telling everybody not to do something, and they're finding themselves doing it all the time. We're going to get that in chapter 7 when Paul talks about wanting to do good, but he finds himself not being able to do it. And we're going to get a good lesson about the flesh tonight. Everyone say, I do not want to know. No, <laughs> that's okay. And so basically, so chapter 2 is about religious people looking down their nose, judging and condemning others. Amen? Chapter 3, what's that about? All have sinned. It doesn't matter if you're religious, non-religious. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we need a Savior. Can you say amen? And chapter 4, you got it in your notes now. What's chapter 4 about? And afterwards. Very good. Because we see Abraham, right? He was, what, 320 years before the law was given to Moses? But we find him through faith, believing God, and was counted him for righteousness. Then after the law, King David. He believed in God instead of following the works of the law. He believed in God and it was accounted to him for what? Righteousness. Amen. He even walked into the temple, not being a high priest, and partook of the showbread. Didn't harm him. Why? Because he had faith in God. All right, chapter four, what's chapter four about? Oh, sorry, chapter five. Chapter five shows us how sin entered into mankind and death by sin and the free gift of righteousness comes through Jesus Christ and his finished work. Amen. Remember, we are two people. Can you tell me? The old person and the new person in Christ. Which is running your life right now? New person in Christ. Amen. Chapter 6. What was it about? We are dead to sin, but alive in God through Christ. The great, we call that a great exchange. And then we gave you a scripture for that. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Let me just read it to you. It says, for he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of of God in him. Notice the term might become. Why is that in there? 
because you have a choice to walk with Jesus or not. All right, here's my point underneath the word point there. Now here in chapter 7, we will see Paul pointing out that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. The Jewish people were married to the law. Don't forget that, okay? They didn't consider leaving the practice of Judaism until they died. So, I mean, it was really hard to lead somebody that's Jewish to the Lord, okay? So we got to get that. Now, Paul, Paul was a Pharisee at one time. Now, whether you knew this or not, but a Pharisee has to be married before he can be a Pharisee. So Paul, we don't see him married when he's writing. So what happened to his wife? Well, historians say she up and left him when he became a Christian. Because they usually have a funeral for you when you're Jewish. You see? That's why it's quite a struggle. You know what I mean? And so, just I think you caught that part. Now, so to receive Jesus was to commit adultery subject to death. Paul points out that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law and they were freed from the law because Christ fulfilled its demands once and for all. Say amen. amen. Now the law was dead to them when they received Christ. They are now free to serve the living God through Christ. So you're going to see that very thing unravel as we read Romans 7. Starting in verse 1. You ready? Follow along. Married to the law. Are you doing you not know, brethren? For I speak to those who know the law. So who is he talking to? He's talking to Jews, isn't he? Amen. So those that know the law is talking to the Jewish individuals, okay? That the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Verse 2. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. Okay. Now I'm going to point out what that means later. Again, hiccups. Sorry about that. But if the husband dies, now listen, but if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is freed from the law of her husband so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Now what he's talking about is not marriage. He's talking about how a Jewish person is married to the law. And as long as the law is instilled and the law is, um, what do you call, resolute or in operation, if you left the law as a Jew, you were considered an adulterer and you were to be stoned. Are you with me? So catch this. So she's adulterous. So look at the first three notes. Paul is speaking to the Jewish believers who were married to the law. The law was fulfilled in Christ. See, the law wasn't done away with. It was fulfilled. There's a difference because some people will jump on you real quick. It was done away with. No, it wasn't done. It was fulfilled. In fact, the only thing of the law, okay, that was really done away with, this is the, it was the curse of the law. So God, through Christ, redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse himself or cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Well, you see what I'm saying? So the law was fulfilled in Christ. So we follow Christ from our heart. Even if we slip up, we're covered. Because the one who fulfilled all the demands of the law and sealed it and fulfilled it was Christ. So you and I don't have to measure up to the law. We just walk with Christ. Now, I'm going to say something to you. We don't have to measure up with Jesus Christ. Well, so we can't. He's perfect. So we go to him and say, God, help me. And he says, all right, you and I, let's walk through our day. Let's have fun. Let's, let's exchange. Let's talk. 
Now, one thing I'm going to tell you, you're going to laugh at this. I, I, years ago, I caught wind of Solomon's prayer. God, give me wisdom, not so that I could have revenge on my enemies or, or have riches or honor, but Lord, so I may help your people. And it says that God loved that, that he asked for it out of the right motive. And he says, not only will you get this wisdom, but you'll get all the riches and honor and everything else. But so I decided I was going to ask for that wisdom. God, give me the, your wisdom to operate. Now, so if you're not careful, this is how funny we are. You can laugh with me. I started seeing how stupid everybody was. Whoops. Way out of balance. Nobody was stupid. You would just see the wisdom of how to do it versus the wisdom of doing it wrong. But what we want to do is we want to address somebody being smart or being stupid on the basis of performance. No. Because when you got God's wisdom, everything this side of heaven is short. Has flaws. So God doesn't look us that way. He says, come on, buddy up with me. Yoke up with me. Unless you and I walk with my wisdom. So I ask God for wisdom. And I said, Lord, what's happening to me? I start seeing all kinds of weird things that I need to straighten up. He says, you wanted some of my wisdom, didn't you? <laughs> cut it off. Cut it off. No. God will always temper your, what you ask with grace and all that kind of stuff. But you got to realize that even some of the gifts of the Spirit can be misused. You know, like prophecy and some of those things. But anyway, so I, 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 God started showing me things, and I was mishandling it. God shows you a fall to somebody else. It's, it's not for you to pick on them. It's for you to pray for them. Maybe support. Is there a way I can help you? I notice you got the ladder upside down. <laughs> Moving right along. Are you with me? Now, so Paul is speaking to the Jewish believers. He says, look, when you accept Christ, you're not an adultery. You're a new creature. Point two, under the law was dead to the believer. Why is the law dead to a believer? Because we have Jesus Christ in us. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus where there is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free, male nor female. But in Christ, we are all one, aren't we? Okay, so here's how the devil works. You guys know that. He makes us Divided. He puts us in little categories. Even in psychology of the world will say, you're one of these type or one of these type. Puts you in a box. But God doesn't put us in a box. He puts us in his heart. And we put him in our heart. And we can't live within anybody else's labels or, or opinions because the Bible says don't judge. But instead, we walk with God, and we let God be creative through us, and we enjoy the ride. Can you say amen? amen? Thirdly, remember, the devil likes to divide us up. Amen. Males against females, Jews against Gentiles, black against white, red against yellow, you know, whatever that. He said wars, rumors of wars, nation shall rise against nation. Huh? Satan is a divider. That's why unity, love, is all, if something comes up, creates a division, drop it. It's not worth it. Can you say amen? Unless it's dividing you away from the devil. That's okay. All right. We should serve in the newness of the spirit. Can you say amen? But remember these Jewish people, there were a lot of men in Rome. They were seeking education and all. These Jewish people didn't know how to seek God in the spirit. They were, remember, they were seeking God by works. Cain, God, what do you think of my garden? Isn't this cool? It was all right until he started offering it in, in, instead of the sacrifice of an animal. God loves you, what you do for him. He loves everything you do, but if you offer it up as an excuse to your relationship, your personal daily relationship, stop doing it until you get your relationship down. Say amen, somebody. Verse 4, Romans 7. Therefore, my brethren, 
you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another. Now, he's still talking to Jewish people who have that background. Remember, the Jewish nation influenced a lot of Rome, a lot of, the, of that area, Asia Minor and such. Okay, so, I mean, it was like the big move, you know? The Jewish God, the Hebrew God wiped everybody out. Pay attention to him. Don't make him mad, you know? <clears throat> All right. To him who was raised from the dead, that we should fear or bear the fruit of God. How many here know that we should bear fruit? Yeah. Not works, fruit. Okay. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. For example, you might not lust over somebody as a Jew, but you might really like it if you find somebody in adultery and you get to be part of the stoning committee. You see what I mean? Weren't all those people with rocks when they found the woman caught in adultery? You see, so their type of sin is, ooh, it's fun. We can put judgment and make people get do these things. Sort of a control thing. While sinners of different varieties have different areas. Some lusts of the flesh, some control of power, some money, whatever the deal is. Satan doesn't care. He, he, he doesn't want you to get around Christ. Can you say amen? Because that's when our life comes to, together. All right. So he says, to him that raised dead for the, why? That we should walk in the newness of life so we should bear fruit to God. Verse 5, for when we were in the flesh, sinful passions were aroused by the law at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now, verse 6, we have been delivered from the law, having died to what, were held, what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Do you know what he means by that? The letter killeth, the spirit giveth life. Let me put it this way. If you preach just the word, but you have no charisma, love, and spirit, you're going to kill somebody. Because the spirit works with the word. The word works, works with the spirit. In the dark ages, okay, the Holy Spirit was there. But there was no word for him to work with. And the moment the renaissance happening, they started printing the Bible again, and people started believing again. As soon as they did that, the Holy Spirit had somebody to work with. That's why you hear preachers like me tell you, get in the Word, get in the Word. So God, is the Spirit of God can work with you and use you to do great things for Him. But if you're not in the Word, then He has to reason with you. And you know how your reasoning is, just like mine. It has some quirks in it. Are you still with me? But now we have been delivered from the law. Amen? Let's serve a newness of life. All right, I've got to turn my page here. A couple of points underneath that scripture. Point one. Because Jesus fulfilled the law, we are dead to the law through the body of Christ. Say amen. amen. Remember, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Second. We as children of God are to bear fruit to God. Our Father is glorified when we produce much fruit, especially in the face of the devil. Folks, how can you laugh? How can you enjoy God when there's a crisis the devil's making all around you? When everything is falling apart, how can you just laugh and enjoy God? That's the whole thing. You get so caught up with God, the things out there don't affect you in here, in your heart. But rather what you have in your heart affects your out there. Can you say amen? Don't build the, the word around your life. Build your life around the word. Amen. So we go on. The third thing is when the law pointed out man's sin, kind of like a, 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 um, um, a street limit sign, a speed limit sign, you're going 35, it seems to be right, until you see the sign, 15 miles an hour school zone. Suddenly, you found yourself, you got to do something. Right? Okay. 
Well, the law came in to show man, you got to do something like surrender and accept God, you know. All right, so it goes on. Fourthly, even in the best efforts of man, the law will condemn you. Verse four, I mean, point four. We can't follow the law. Why? We follow Jesus Christ instead. Can you say amen? If you think, if I got up every Sunday and I preached, thou shall not, thou shall not, and if I preach, you better, you better, you know what will happen? Well, eventually nobody will be here, but everybody will rise up in rebellion first. Because, especially Americans, but nobody wants to be told what to do. Hello? They just don't want to be told what to do. We're an American. And so God doesn't really necessarily tell us what to do. But he helps us to do it. Rather, he suggests to do it. He says, you know, it's best that you do it. I place before you life and death. Choose the life. You know, it's best that you do it. And then I'll help you do it. But he doesn't say too many times in the New Testament, if you don't, this is going to happen. Hello? Right? So what is really hard for, for ministers is to not preach that way from the pulpit. You know four or five families are in rebellion, they've been gossiping, so you put it in your sermon. No, 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 no. No, avoid that. Let's move right on past that. My next point is, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin. That means you have to acknowledge you're dead to sin. You might not feel dead to sin. You might not think you're dead to sin. But it says, consider yourself to be dead to sin. That attitude with God will help keep you safe. Right? If you have it in your heart not to do something and you just won't do it, you won't do it, and it's kept you safe all these years, some little, some little temptation is not going to come around and knock you off of that. So when Paul says, reckon yourself to be dead, get an idea that you're really dead. You aren't taking yourself with you. You're leaving this here. So stop peddling it around and pampering it. Moving right along, okay? So reckoning yourself to be dead to sin, okay? We are exposed ourselves to God's presence due to self before him and get up in Christ and live and thrive. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Can you say amen? All right, now, Romans 7, 7 through 9. The law points out sin. How many know the law does? You're going 35 in a 15 mile an hour zone. Okay, you got to do something. If you don't, you're going to get a ticket. Okay, listen to this. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Or on the contrary, it would not have, we would not have known sin except through the law. For if I would not have known covetousness unless the law said you shouldn't covet right but sin taking the opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire how dare he tell me about that well that's smart I like I'm going to fix him I'm just going ahead and not do it and see if he you know that bothers him you see, hello, we can, we can take our imagination and go that way a little bit, but let's not. <laughs> but sin, taking the opportunity, will always try to take an opportunity in you. Produce in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. The people down in Africa have never heard the law, never heard anything. They still have sin in them. It's still destroying them. But they have nothing telling them what they're doing is wrong. So they go on living in deception. Until one day their heart cries out. Now a person could go along like that for a long, long time. Maybe right up to the end of their life. But God will always, never be accused of not being fair. 
So if you got somebody who's never heard the gospel, he lives in the bush, I mean, and God's starting to teach him the gospel through the trees and the birds and all. He comes up to the last part of his life. Even God himself, Jesus Christ, will show up at his death to let him know, Do you, you have a choice. I'm the guy who was trying to get your attention all your life. And now you have a right to choose me. So that the devil can accuse that you let that man go all his life without appealing to him. You see? Now, I'm not writing off people not getting saved or, or confessing, but Romans 1 says that they're without excuse, that even nature itself declares God's glory. All right, let's move on past this. So the law pointed out sin. Hey, look, you got to straighten this up. Okay. So he says in verse 9, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived in me and I died. So all that time when he was a young kid, he was goofing off and everything. When the law came and he was studying for the Torah and all that, all of a sudden he saw what a wretched man he was. Because the law points out what? Sin. Tells you what you can be doing, but you're never able to <laughs> without Jesus. Can you say amen? And then a couple of points underneath that. The law is holy. Say the law is holy. But we are all under sin. So the law points out our flaws and condemns man's sinful works. Cain again. Look at my garden. Like I grew some wonderful tomatoes last year and some peppers the year before. But I don't go before God and say, look at my garden. Because I knew he grew them. He's the one that caused them to grow. He's the one that caused them to be good. Amen. I'm not presenting something that he's doing to him as a sacrifice. Hello. And that's what we do. A lot of times we present our works. God, what do you think? And you don't hear anything and you go, oh. The idea is don't do that. Just go before God, help me do this project. So it comes out all right, God. Start your day off praying with your wife. You know, and praying and, and getting God's perspective on the day. And then launch out having your priorities. I used to make lists. First things first, second things third, dot, dot, dot. God helped me get through the list oh, four or five times. I never I could get all through that list. But at least I kept it in front of me till I finished the projects. I didn't try to do nine projects at once, not finishing any of them. So God has a way of taking the confusion and all the stuff of our best tries and focus them in and making them good. Can you say amen? Thank God. All right. Two, the sin nature in us without Christ will drive us to sin. We're sinners because of the sin nature, right? The law points out every time Jesus saves us, the law points out every time we fail. But then Jesus saves us. Then thirdly, the nature of sin in our flesh will cause us to fall, will cause us to stumble. But until the law, we fail anyway. But don't know why we fail until the law came. Thou shalt not covet. What do you mean? I can't have pictures of my, my neighbor's wife? <laughs> Hello. You know, you go to some of these countries. I mean, when we were in missions, mission people, one of the first things when I first went down on the mission field, they told us, never talk negative about the, the government. And you'll notice that people down here think nothing of having two or three wives. So they'll go travel for two or three weeks and they'll have a wife over there. This is an island. I mean, it's crazy. And then they go way over there and I'll do some ministering over there and I have a wife over there. And they don't think it's wrong until the white missionaries came in and says, hey, what are you doing? Huh? Well, if you read the book of First and Second Timothy, it says husband of but one wife at a time. And some people take it, well, if you've ever been divorced, you never can be in the ministry. That's, yeah, well, there's great big, huge denominations teach that. So all you can do is be a deacon. No, you're forgiven of all sin, 
not, not that you take lightly marriage, but I want to let you know, okay? So God forgives how many sin? And everybody deserves a new start, right? <clears throat> believe in people. Don't believe that they're going to fail. God looks to the good of us. And he strengthens that good. Amen. Often others look to the wrong. Okay, so let's move on. All right, Romans 7, verse 9. The law was a holy signpost. How many know, though, the, the sign that says population of Puyallup, you know, what, 53,000, blah, 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 blah. You don't stop your car, go over and hug the sign, say, I'm in Puyallup. <laughs> well, that's what the Jewish people did. They got the law given to them to help point to Christ, and they made a signpost out of the law and built tabernacles around it. And then when somebody's seeking God, they blasted them. Before you can get saved, we've got to cut your flesh and circumcise you. Ah, you ain't going to touch me. Hello? And Paul calls them mutilators, flesh mutilators. You cause people to circumcise themselves thinking they're going to better their, their Christianity. Hello? Pentecostals do that. You got to do this to wear your hair. You got to do that. It's going to make your Christianity much better. See, as you can see, man always wants to get their hands in there, in the pie, and mess everything up. Say, not me. All right, you ready? Okay, so, so, and the commandment which was made to bring life, I found to bring death. Verse 10. For sin, taken an occasion by the commandment, deceived me. So he thought he could get saved by following the law. And by it, killed me. And instead of him seeing hope, we're going to get saved following the law. It says you're nothing but a sinner. You can't live up to it. You're going to be sentenced to hell. It killed him. But he missed the one part that the Jewish, a lot of the Jewish people were talking about. And that was the Messiah that had come. So a lot of these people were thinking, I got to give up my Judaism and divorce myself and, and come meet this Christ. So you can see the wrestling that was going on in there. And Paul, thank God, now you know why God picked Paul. The top of the line Pharisee. I mean, he was ahead of his class. He was what? Kamalata. Sava Kamalata. I forget all what they call all those college frats and all that kind of stuff. He was top of the line. Lost everything to find Jesus on the road to Damascus. All right, so let's go on. Okay, therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Has then the good become death to me? Certainly not, but sin in me, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So he was doing good and he was doing it the wrong way. Have you ever said a good thing the wrong way? Or the right thing the wrong way? You ever tried to do something and it came out wrong? Well, we do. That's why we need the grace of God. That's, that's why I say tank up in the morning. Let him give you his grace. So when you get up in the day and you feel a little clumsy, you say, God, I need some grace. And they straighten your path out and attitude and right on the money. Yeah, my wife sticks the Holy Ghost on me every morning. Get him, God. Right there? Amen. All right, so now, verse 14. For we know the law is spiritual, but Paul says, I am carnal, sold under sin. We found that out in chapter 5. For what I am doing, I don't understand. Did you know there's a lot of people today that don't even understand themselves? And yet the Bible will point it out, God will point it out and help us understand ourselves. So here he's a Pharisee, doctor of law. Nicodemus in chapter 3 of John was kind of like that. It was a teacher of, of the doctrines of the law. 
and yet didn't understand himself. See, being religious is not going to give you answers for what you need. God wants to walk with us personally, and he wants to work out all the flaws in our life. So if you're one of those guys, I'm going to just use something funny, that always hits your finger with a hammer when you're pounding a nail, he wants to help you so that doesn't happen anymore. But don't keep on pounding the nail and whacking your finger. Ask him to come in and help. You're doing a project, but it's not coming out all right. You're lacking some wisdom. Don't be prideful and say, well, you know, I can do this. Oh, man, you're going to get embarrassed. God will just pull the plug on you. You'll fumble all around and feel foolish. Don't do that. Just go, God, I, I don't know. And God says, great, I do. Come on, let's be a buddy together. I can't tell you how many meals and how many recipes I put together with God's help that just blows our mind rather than just following step by step, you know. God wants to add some pizzazz in us and he wants to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. But in order for that to happen, we've got to look, get out of the way and stop being a bumbling bum bumbling around you know let the control of things go into God don't be that stubborn amen don't be a Jacob <laughs> oh, my hip is out of line <clears throat> all right let's go on a couple points <clears throat> the ten commandments only brought what didn't bring life sin in Paul took its course and deceived and killed him the law only pointed out what sin was doing in him. The law was holy and good to point that out. Yet it could not stop him from sinning. Hello. Thirdly, Paul as a man and a Pharisee couldn't understand himself. But we know now what was going on, don't we? What was going on, folks? There was two of them. There was the old man and the new man. Right? And he was trying to serve God and the old man. Do the law. Do it just right. Watch this. Don't move that. Got to do that. Got to do Just got to be. That's, that's legalism. There's no joy in that. Folks, I don't want, when I walk in the room, all your joy to leave. I just want you to do God a good job with with God, a labor of love, and be happy. Amen? Not freak out when I walk in the room. Just make sure things are in order, you know? Same thing with God. When he walks into our life, he knows our life is way out of order. But he says, I'm here to help. Yay! We need it. Can you say amen? We need help. That's what he loves. He loves you asking him. Help, help, help. Sometimes you got to get all blubbery. God, I need help. And you know, we're so prideful. It's really hard for me to say that. Next thing you know, you start cracking and blubbering up and everything, and it helps on its way. You just got out of the way there. So it, it, sometimes tears are really good and refreshing. If there are tears of joy and tears of softness before God. All right, so let's go on a little farther. And he says in verse, what, uh, 15 or 16? Okay. For what I will to do, that I don't practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I, I agree with the law. That it's good, but now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin nature that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, everyone pinch your flesh a little. You in camera, pinch your flesh. This is your flesh. That is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Did you hear that? Now you know why. You can't please God in your flesh. You get up in the morning and you pray until you're out of your flesh. Start praising, worshiping, and you keep your minds out. Sometimes 
I have what we call a prayer of meditation. I pray and get all saturated with God, and then I'm, I'm quiet. I just sit before God, and God starts showing me things. Now listen carefully. He might show me so-and-so, they're struggling in this area, because it just comes through as a thought. But it's not a negative thought. It's just a thought. So instead of me voicing what I'm seeing, I just simply say, God, you're showing me that. So therefore, in the name of Jesus, give that to him and help him. Bypasses Satan. Bypasses everything. Bypasses my judging or thinking they need this. Instead, this floats through my mind. I mean, it could be any subject that God wants. Something pops up and I say, that's right, Lord. I ask you to help in that area. And I call it prayer of meditation because the meditation thoughts don't come from you. They don't come from the devil. They just sort of drift in showing an area that you can pray and it has a peace about it, but it's descriptive. It's kind of like it needs lubrication. You put a little lubrication on it. You don't mouth it. You just simply, Lord, give them that what they need. But sometimes we'll sit and we'll analyze that. Yeah, that's right. And we'll start talking about it. Yeah, they could straighten up in that area. <laughs> no, we have move out of the spirit, rely back into the kong and clash and banging of the flesh. Can you say amen? No. So the good that I want to do, I, find, I cannot find. Verse 19, for the good that I will do, I do not do. But the evil I will not do, I practice. Now if I do, and I love the way he says it. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I, listen, who do it. But sin who dwells in me. If you get mad at me and you're thinking dirty names, you know, sometimes it happens. That's the sin within you doing that. It isn't really how you think of me. <laughs> Amen? Hello. You know, and, and so we've got to know ourselves more. And let me tell you, the only way you're going to really get to know you is in prayer with God. Seriously. Because God will show you things about yourself in a gentle way that you'll know more about yourself in a couple of sessions with God, then you did all your life long trying to understand yourself. Why do I do certain things, God? Stop trying to figure it out. Just simply say, and it's not right. Please help me overcome it. And then he will show you. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally and doesn't withhold. But let him ask in faith, not doubting. For a man that doubts is like a wave driven of the sea, tossed by the wind. For a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So you're loving the Lord in the middle of the day and somebody says something to you, now you're irritated. Double-mindedness. If that happens, don't panic. Stop and say, no, I'm not going to take offense at that. Leadership. We have to really be careful because we're matter-of-fact. I don't want to beat around the bush trying to tell you what I want. I want to say, get the ladder and do it now. You hurt my feelings. Hello. Let's get beyond that. Have we gotten beyond that? We should. Anyway, it's no big deal. But see, we all are rehearsing in our minds right now when I'm talking how often I do that. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be doing, so Lord, if I do that, help me. But you're dwelling, yeah, is he picking on me now? You see, that's how the brain works. Shut that thing down. Peace be still. All right, last scripture. Say amen, everybody. A couple of points. Here the apostle found out he couldn't quit sinning. He wanted to do good, but... His flesh wouldn't allow him to. Notice he said that in the flesh, nothing good dwells. That sin nature is in man's flesh. It must be neutralized. We do that in prayer. This is done only by accepting Jesus Christ and following him, not the law. 
Okay, finally, the last scriptures, Romans 7, 21 through 25. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. Stop, everybody, look up at me for a minute. You have flesh. There's not one good thing in it other than brush its teeth, bathe its bod, feed it, don't let it get away with itself, keep it subjected to God, and you'll have a good life. But if you don't do those things, the enemy in the flesh will find a way to get out of sports. It just does. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We need to return to the shepherd and the bishop of our souls, the way we think about ourselves. Amen? Are you with me? And so basically, if you catch yourself to get out of sorts, instead of saying that way or running off, just take a minute out to pray. You keep in that holy presence of God. Let God tumble you through your day with you enjoying the journey, getting things done, and the things that uh, seem to challenge you don't affect you as much. Say amen, somebody. All right, so, even though I find evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. See, our spirit wants to obey God. But I see another law in my members, arms, legs, eyes, you know, warring against the law of my mind. I want to serve God. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Then listen to this. Oh, wretched man that I am. He finally got it. He wasn't all that. Look at the person across the way and say, you're not all that. And I'm not either. And I love you anyway. You know what's refreshing? Is I'm not looking for my wife to perform anything. I just love her. You don't want to be looking for your husband to perform anything. Just love him. And when a person feels comfortable in the presence of God, they'll open their heart and God will make them into champions. But if you've got fears and anxieties, and you know, those things kind of fight against us from getting that way. So trust the Lord. Lean not to your own understanding. All your ways throughout the day, acknowledge him. and He'll direct your paths. You'll have a fulfilled, glorious life in Christ. Now, I have only tasted a few things. But I tell you what, I have two, three volumes of books I could write just in the miracles God did with me. You have a year, you're young yet. Get out there and pray for people. Slap hands on stuff. Cast out some devils. It's all fun. Amen. As long as you're led by the Spirit. All right, I'm finishing. Say he's finishing. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He calls this body, body of death. Is it going to go with this, folks? It's going to change, isn't it? God's going to remake it. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, so then, with my mind, I may serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. That brings us right up to what chapter? See, chapter 7 has to do with Paul being a Pharisee. Now, he's coming from a Pharisee thought of saying the law can't save you. But he's already born again when he's writing this letter. So he's relating how hard it is to follow God naturally. It's impossible. But rather... Ask God to come in, get born again, and then every day afterwards, ask God to help you through the day. Hello? Let's say you're broke, and somebody says, hey, I brought a huge wad of cash. All you need to do is ask me when there's something you need. Now, if you're over humble, you won't ask for anything and suffer. And if you're just naturally humble, you say, yeah, that looks good. And the other person will say, hey, wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like that? And then if you're real selfish, you'll say, I want that, I want that. When you ordered the meal, I had one lady 
tried to really irk me. So we took her out to eat, and so she ordered steak and lobster, the most expensive thing. And she didn't even finish it. And God says, what do you think about that? He says, you know how I, what I think about that. He says, you know. So some people do things in spite and stuff like that. But you know what? We're not to be caught up in what they're doing. We're to be caught up what God's doing in our hearts. Say amen. And if he tells us in that area to do something, we will. All right. So a couple of questions. The law that is present is sin nature. How many know everybody has it? It's the nature of the devil, folks. That's what it is, where it came from. It rules almost everyone. But for a Christian, it can be held in check by prayer. Didn't Jesus say, pray with me? For your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. So as as a Christian, Paul says, get out of the flesh. Start your day in the spirit. How do I go about it? You know now. I teach it. We've been teaching it for years. You just do it. Makes a whole lot of difference, doesn't it? Yeah. I know you're doing it. And you go, wow, just a small little adjustment. Like, Well, yeah. Satan doesn't want us to catch those little things. All right, couple of, second point. Christian in their heart will follow God. But from time to time, we'll have trouble in the flesh. And you have to learn your balance. Everyone say balance. Okay? You got to have your balance, especially if you're walking through rough areas. You don't want to trip and fall. Can you say amen? So you need that graceful balance of God. Thirdly, Paul recognizes that he was a wretched person in the flesh. And how can he get how can he get free? Through Jesus Christ. Four. With his mind, he wants to serve God, but with his flesh, wants to serve sin. These two are contrary. He even calls his body a body of death. Who will deliver him? And then five. Christians today must walk from the inside out. Everyone say inside out. You know what I mean by that? Walk from your spirit man out. Because we used to walk from our outside in. Right? Feelings. What we see, touch, taste, and smell. All affected our inward. Now that we're born again, what's inwardly, God, needs to affect our outwardly. Can you say amen? So we follow God from our heart, out, inwardly, outwardly. There's a song that says, from the inside out. From the inside out. From, I forget how it goes, but it's a really beautiful worship song. From the inside out. All right, you with me? So Galatians 5 sums it up, 16 through 18. Paul again is writing in this one, but he says, This I say, walk in the Spirit. Everyone say, walk in the Spirit. Now, here's some key words. The word walk is the Greek word to mean make a trail, build a habit. Everyone say, make a trail, build a habit. So to walk in the spirit means you've got to make a trail that you and God walk in and to make it a habit. Okay? Things that you do a lot, you're good at. Some of you scrabble, some of the word games. You're good at because you're doing it. Well, God wants us to do the things of the spirit just like they're just part of our life. What happens is it becomes such a flow, and everybody goes, wow, and you're starting to see God's handiwork in just about everything that he flows through you. That's what we want for you. We want you to experience as much as God on this side of life as you can. And to affect you, it, it, you can't. We're all about helping you be better. Okay? So if you're not getting any better, pastor's going to get on your case. Please don't take it personally. Because if you've been the same way for years, something is wrong. Please don't be stubborn enough to think it isn't. So listen, this I say, walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill what your flesh lusts for. For the flesh lusts against the spirit. They're not buddies at all. 
the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another. So that, here's again a confirmation, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the bondages of the law. And the law there is really a law that we, you don't hear too much about, but see, because the law points out sin, right? But there's a law that's in us called the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 2 says, they have set us free from the law of sin and death. So your flesh has a law of sin and death. In your spirit, you have God. What's in your spirit needs to overcome and overshadow the law of sin and death. That's why Satan always gets the victory when he draws you out of the spirit into the flesh. Every man's tempted when he's drawn out by his own desires and enticed. James 1. And then when desire, you lay with sin long enough, it produces death. And death when it's finished, you know. So do not err, my beloved brethren. So what we are to do as Christians is get up in the morning and analyze ourselves and say, how am I doing, God? Work with me throughout the day. By the end of the day, I want to be better than I was yesterday. Do you look at God's relationship? Do. He'll make you better. Next thing you know, you'll find out you won't be doing the same things that irritate everybody. Did you know you do things that irritate people? Do they tell you about it? Yeah. So, you know, well, listen, you guys are, I consider you elders as far as older. So I'm not going to rebuke you or anything like that. But if you're wrong, I'm going to point it out. But you need to give honor to everybody because respect is something that's missing. But we need to respect God enough for him to change us. And the last thing I want to share is, and we're done, is when you're praying for people to change, ask God to change you at the same time. Amen. Do, just do. Just say, like, for example, I, I plan on doing this is when we get our taller tables, I plan on getting up front and videotaping me and my morning session with God. I'm just going to go through it and show a visual what I do. Not that you copy it, but uh, what you carry through. So how, It's so simple and so easy, but so profoundly changing that I think everybody should see at least what to do. And I didn't learn this on my own. God had to teach me to do this. He had to teach me because he knew I was going to lose my leg. He had to teach me to be in a condition where this wouldn't destroy me, you know, uh, as far as getting depressed and all that kind of thing. Well, if you got something out of that tonight, would you give the Lord a praise? <laughs> Amen. Romans.